From secret pregnancies to alleged assaults, plenty of dark secrets in the history of Hollywood have gotten famous actors booted from high-profile movies. Laurence Olivier rose up through the UK theatrical world and is widely considered one of the finest actors of the 20th century. But most of the accolades he enjoyed happened well into his career. In the early 1930s, Olivier landed roles in a variety of films, including the historical biopic Queen Christina. At the time, he was new to the movies, and his lack of a reputation preceded him. His Queen Christina co-star, Greta Garbo, initially accepted the casting of Olivier as romantic lead Don Antonio, but then she filmed a love scene with him, and she decided that he needed to go. As he later recalled in a TV interview, what happened was that I started working with Garbo, and I just didn't measure up. I wasn't good enough for her. She was an absolute master of her trade, and she was a great figure, and had an enormous image to the public. But she had to fire me because there was nothing else to do. The part of Don Antonio eventually went to John Gilbert, a frequent co-star of Garbo's. Known as Hollywood's It Girl, the trend-setting Clara Bow was a major box office draw in the early film industry. She starred in dozens of hit movies, including Wings, the first winner of the Academy Award for Best Picture. In 1930, Bo ceded control of her extensive fortune to her secretary, Daisy DeVoe, an arrangement that lasted less than a year. Bo fired DeVoe, who responded by stealing $20,000, financial paperwork, letters, and jewelry, and then announced plans to sue for unpaid salary. That suit didn't happen, but a dramatic trial did after DeVoe was indicted on 37 charges of grand theft. Bo's spending habits came to light during the proceedings, as did excerpts of the very personal letters stolen by DeVoe. Deeply embarrassed by the ordeal, Bo checked into the Glendale Sanatorium in May of 1931. At her request, Paramount fired her from her next film, City Streets. She then retired from filmmaking and went to live on the Nevada ranch of her husband, actor Rex Bell. British actor Vivian Lee reportedly beat out more than 200 women to play Scarlett O'Hara in 1939's Gone with the Wind. She would go on to win the Oscar for Best Actress for that film, and another for 1951's A Streetcar Named Desire. But soon afterwards, her career was in jeopardy due to health problems. I've always depended on the kindness of strangers. In the late 1930s, Lee reportedly began to demonstrate symptoms of bipolar disorder, or manic depression as it was known at the time. With no effective medication available to balance her moods, she was subject to serious episodes of mania and sadness. Her behavior was so unnerving to producers of the 1954 film Elephant Walk that they summoned her husband Laurence Olivier to the set. He wasn't able to help though, and shortly thereafter, filming moved to Los Angeles. Mental health episodes continued to befall Lee, as she suffered from extreme depression and verbally attacked people on set. Producers again sought outside help. Fellow actor David Niven held Lee down while a nurse delivered an intravenous dose of sedatives. Ultimately, Lee was fired and she returned to her home in London while Elizabeth Taylor took her place in Elephant Walk. In the mid-1960s, George C. Scott seemed poised to make the jump from small screen character actor to big screen leading man. After breaking through in 1964's Dr. Strangelove, he was all set to star alongside Audrey Hepburn in the 1966 heist comedy, How to Steal a Million. That movie's director, William Wyler, was among the most esteemed and powerful filmmakers in Hollywood, and he very much valued punctuality on his projects. Alas, Scott's failure to meet that standard proved to be his undoing. As Wyler told producer Lawrence Terman in Terman's memoir, So You Want to Be a Producer, the very first day of filming, Scott was an hour late to the set. I fired him immediately. The studio went crazy. They begged me to reconsider, but I stood firm. Scott's career would recover soon enough, as he went on to play the title general in the 1970 biopic Patton, for which he won the Oscar for lead actor. The 1935 horror movie Dante's Inferno was inspired by the 14th century narrative poem The Divine Comedy. It starred Spencer Tracy as fairground operator Jim Carter, making it his 25th film for Fox Film Corporation since 1930. Tracy would soon go on to win a couple of back-to-back -back Oscars for Captain's Courageous and Boys Town, but at the time, he didn't have a lot of clout. Nevertheless, he tried to insist that the Dante's Inferno script be rewritten to his liking. At one point, he even got into a drunken fight with director Harry Lackman. He reportedly destroyed whatever props, scenery, and lights were in the immediate vicinity before security guards could subdue him. All right now, folks, get around, get around, get around! 
Following the completion of filming, Fox executives met with Tracy and warned him to behave properly on his next movie. He then immediately found his way into a bar, and after drinking for four hours, he returned to the Fox offices and confronted his bosses. They ended his contract on the spot. Tough guy actor Robert Mitchum had a reputation for playing some of the most intimidating characters in cinema history. He was all set to star in 1955's Blood Alley as a merchant ship captain who helps Chinese peasants escape to Hong Kong. But he didn't last long. As a press release distributed by Warner Brothers announced at the time, Robert Mitchum has been fired after delaying production and refusing to apologize for creating disagreements among the production staff. Reporters descended on the Blood Alley set, where one of them overheard a crew member comment that Mitchum had been under the influence of drugs and that he punched a driver and nearly killed him. Mitchum then told his side of the story in a press conference, held in his motel room. While dressed in his underwear and drinking wine straight from the bottle, he announced, It was all a result of my championing of the little guy. I want them treated right. Mitchum had evidently advocated for some crew workers who weren't being given necessary hygiene products by Warner Brothers. In his telling, a confrontation over that issue had turned violent. John Wayne ultimately took his place in Blood Alley. For better or worse, becoming a movie star is as much about appearance as it is about talent. Clint Eastwood has been a major movie star for decades, but he got his start as a mere bit player in the 1950s, and his career almost ended before it really began, because some executives thought he lacked the necessary physical attributes required for stardom. In 1959, Universal Studios ended his contractual agreement with Eastwood and his friend and fellow aspiring actor Burt Reynolds. Ironically enough, this future leading man was deemed too much of a liability in the looks department. As Reynolds recalled on Larry King Live in 2000, he was fired because his Adam's apple stuck out too far. He talked too slow, and he had a chipped tooth and he wouldn't get it fixed. Uh, I know what you're thinking. Considering what's happened in the decades since, Eastwood clearly had the last laugh. While he doesn't act much anymore, he's continued to regularly direct well into his 80s and 90s. For the better part of a decade, Judy Garland was MGM's go-to performer for grand movie musicals. This run, of course, included The Wizard of Oz in 1939, as well as Meet Me in St. Louis in 1944. When production began on the 1948 musical The Pirate, Garland was cast in the lead role. Alas, she had a history of drug addiction, and she fully relapsed during filming prompting her to rely on a variety of medications to both sleep and to stay awake. That regimen exacerbated Garland's mental health issues, as she would neglect to report for work or refuse to leave her dressing room. After filming, she checked into a mental health facility, and upon returning to Hollywood, she began work on the musical Annie Get Your Gun in the title role. But in the view of MGM executives, Garland's hospitalization hadn't brought her back to her peak. After one month of shooting, the studio dismissed her and brought in Betty Hutton instead. The reported reason was that Garland showed up late to the set too many times, and sometimes intoxicated, appeared to have gained weight, and seemed generally too worn out and unreliable. In the 1950s, Garland appeared on screen much less frequently, and she died fairly young, at the age of 47 in 1969. Signed to a seven-year contract in 1934, Ray Milland became a versatile leading actor for Paramount Pictures. He usually starred in movies that were considered lightweight, like comedies, westerns, and adventures. So it was a bit of a surprise when he was cast in 1945's The Lost Weekend, a drama about an alcoholic writer who engages in a four-day binge drinking session. He lost weight for the role, got drunk in public for real, and spent the night in a New York hospital section for unhoused alcoholics. Down strange, forbidden byways, he wandered in search of his soul. Milland ended up winning an Oscar for his performance, and the film received the Best Picture trophy. He thought he'd transformed his career and graduated to more serious fare, but his bosses at Paramount didn't necessarily agree. In 1948, the studio ordered him to star in a historical drama called Bride of Vengeance. Milland refused to show up to the set, telling Paramount that he thought the role was beneath him and that the resulting film wouldn't be very good. The studio then placed him on a two-month suspension and replaced him in Bride of Vengeance with John Lund. Marilyn Monroe became a screen legend in the 1950s, thanks to classics like Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, How to Marry a Millionaire, and Some Like It Hot. In 1962, she started work on a movie called Something's Gotta Give. 
she was coming off of a year-long hiatus, recovering from gallbladder removal and endometriosis surgeries. She was also struggling through drug addiction and depression. During filming of Something's Gotta Give, Monroe had trouble recalling her dialogue, and crew members noted that she seemed to be both heavily drugged and deeply despondent. But that's if she was even around at all, as she called in sick more often than she showed up, with her absences explained by doctor notes. Satisfied? Completely. In May 1962, after failing to report to the set for several days, Monroe sang Happy Birthday to President John F. Kennedy at an event in New York. Something's Gotta Give director George Cukor, who had given Monroe the go-ahead to attend weeks earlier, got so angry that he had 20th Century Fox fire her due to her frequent absences. The studio also hit her with a $750,000 breach of contract lawsuit. Months later, Fox brought back Monroe after co-star Dean Martin refused to work with her replacement, Lee Remick. But before filming resumed, Monroe was found at her home, dead at the age of 36 from a drug overdose. In the 1930s and 1940s, future United States President Ronald Reagan was a contract player with Warner Brothers. He was never a major box office draw or particularly acclaimed actor, as he mostly headlined second-rate B-movies. By 1950, Reagan had grown tired of this unchallenging work. He'd been forced to sit out movie making for most of 1949 after hurting his leg, and he planned on turning over a new leaf. As he explained to reporter Bob Thomas at the time, after spending most of the last year in bed, I'm going to concentrate on my career in 1950, and there'll be some changes made. I'm going to pick my own pictures. I have come to the conclusion that I can do as good a job of picking as the studio has done. That interview soon crossed the desk of Jack Warner, head of Warner Brothers, Reagan's employer. Warner was unsurprisingly livid, so he wrote to Reagan's agent, Lou Wasserman, to confirm the veracity of the interview. It was all true, and so later that year, when Reagan's contract came up for renewal, Warner declined to re-sign. The future politician departed for Universal, which was at the time seen as a second-tier studio. He then made the 1951 comedy Bedtime for Bonzo, in which he starred alongside a chimpanzee. Why don't you act more like his father instead of like a school teacher? I guess I have got a lot to learn about being father, haven't I? Gene Kelly ruled the world of big-budget movie musicals in the 1940s and 50s. Not only did he hope his way through the likes of An American in Paris and Singing in the Rain, he also choreographed those films' elaborate dance numbers. When expert dancing was a major element of big-screen entertainment in the mid-20th century, Kelly's only real rival was Fred Astaire. And in 1947, Kelly lost a role to him due to an injury of his own creation. Filming was set to begin on Easter Parade in October 1947, and Kelly intended to spend two months preparing and choreographing the dance sequences. But on the day that screenwriter Sidney Sheldon turned in the final script, he was informed that Kelly had broken his leg. Kelly told MGM studio executives that he'd hurt himself practicing his dance moves. But that was a lie to save face. He'd actually suffered a broken ankle during a volleyball game with friends. Kelly grew increasingly angry with his team's poor play, and he kicked a nearby doorframe in frustration so hard that he busted a bone. So, for the sake of the movie, he asked MGM to get rid of him and hire a stare instead. Known as the Great Stone Face for his stoic reaction shots, Buster Keaton was among the most popular figures of the silent film era. Following hits like The General and Steamboat Bill Jr., his star dimmed somewhat as movies with sound became popular. In 1928, he signed an exclusive contract with MGM. Executive Irving Thalberg assigned a studio employee to oversee Keaton's films, in addition to devoting a whole team of writers and other crew members to the comedian's projects. Keaton wasn't used to MGM's routine of churning out movies in this efficient, stratified system, as he'd previously been granted full creative control and hiring authority. Over the span of four years of working in the MGM manner, Keaton grew increasingly unhappy. He coped by drinking heavily, including on set, in 1932, MGM executive and co-founder Louis B. Mayer invited himself to a particularly intense and alcohol-fueled party that Keaton presided over in his dressing room. Viewing the unwelcome presence of the executive as well as a bunch of Mayer's friends as another instance of studio interference, Keaton erupted and threw his boss and his associates out of the party. Days later, he refused to attend an important MGM public relations event. Two days after that, MGM fired Keaton and began aggressively pursuing the Marx Brothers to be their new marquee comedians. You know the old saying, two's company and five's a crowd. 
An icon of silent cinema, Charlie Chaplin wrote and directed many of his own movies, including the 1925 adventure comedy The Gold Rush. He also starred in that film as the Lone Prospector, a riff in his popular tramp character. Chaplin handed the only significant female part in The Gold Rush to Lita Gray, who had previously appeared in only two other films. They were both Chaplin movies, and Gray was about 12 years old when they were produced. She was 15 when Chaplin signed her to a contract, cast her in The Gold Rush, and began a relationship with her. Six months after filming began, Gray became pregnant with Chaplin's child. To avoid statutory rape charges, he married her in a secret ceremony in Mexico. Chaplin's publicity agent then told reporters that Gray had quit not only The Gold Rush, but acting altogether, as she chose instead to spend her days doting on her new husband. The public wasn't yet aware that Gray was pregnant, or that it had happened out of wedlock for that matter. But because the pregnancy was becoming harder to hide as filming continued, Chaplin chose to fire his teenage wife and replace her with Georgia Hale. In the 1930s, it would have been extraordinarily scandalous and potentially career-ending for an unwed A-list Hollywood actor to give birth. That was the fate that Loretta Young was trying to avoid in 1935. As recounted in a 2015 BuzzFeed News interview with Young's daughter-in-law, Linda Lewis, Young became pregnant after she was allegedly assaulted by Clark Gable, her Call of the Wild co-star. Fox demanded that Young clandestinely abort the pregnancy, but as a Roman Catholic who was opposed to birth control and abortion, she refused. So the studio concocted a story in which Young was reportedly recovering from an illness in Europe. She then quietly returned home to Los Angeles and gave birth to a baby girl, whom she then publicly adopted 19 months later. Ultimately, the ruse worked, but that wasn't the only time that Young refused to do what her studio wanted. In 1939, Fox offered her a five-year contract worth $2 million, but she declined to sign. She then attempted to go around the contract system by signing deals with individual studios, but that didn't work. Between 1939 and 1941, she was able to book a part in only one movie. The last big screen credit of her career was 1953's It Happens Every Thursday, although she lived until 2000 when she passed away at the age of 87. If you or anyone you know has been the victim of sexual assault, help is available. Visit the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network website or contact Rain's National Helpline at 1-800-656-HOPE. That's 1-800-656-4673.